VeloFix is the source for all of your bicycle needs. When it comes to parts as well as repair, VeloFix is there to help you get back on the road. It's a mobile bike shop on wheels. Check them out at VeloFix.com. And here in Southern California, Paul Dunlap is there at every gravel event, fondo, and bike race to take care of your bicycle and have you get back out there. Check them out at VeloFix.com. The simple act of riding a bicycle today can put people at risk. If you've been to Southern California, you've seen your share of tourists flooding the beach areas and distracted drivers. When the unavoidable accident happens and you're involved, make sure to protect yourself with an attorney who knows the law and knows bikes. Attorney Josh Benici of Benici Law Group of San Diego has been riding in SoCal for over 25 years. Josh offers free consultations to cyclists, and if you have a bike injury, make sure to call Benici Law Group. For more information, go to BeniciLawGroup.com. Self-criticism, my mind was just going to the place where, oh, the next time we hit the, like the, I forget what the climb, it's like the short, punchy one. Yeah. The next time we hit that, like, you can just let them go. Mm. Like, it's, it's, it's not that big of a deal. And as, like, when I started hearing myself think that, I out loud yelled, no. <laughs> This is the SoCal Cycling Podcast with Brian Coe. SoCal, SoCal, SoCal Cyclist. And I'm assuming that's a Southern Calcutta. Just kidding. <laughs> Probably Southern California. Of course it is. So join us for the next episode. Welcome to the SoCal Cyclist Podcast, the podcast that brings you the people and practice of the Peloton. I'm your host, Brian Coe, and we are approaching the off season. It is currently the week of the World Championships, and I've got to say there are quite a few impressive results so far. We have a couple of Americans, specifically who graduated from the SoCal scene, participating in this year's Worlds. Of course, we have Amber Nevin, who we've had as a former guest doing the time trial, SoCal resident, and uh, the younger guns, Brandon McNulty, who's done a number of CBRs, doing the U23 men's, who got seventh at the time trial, and also doing the road race. And then we also have our own Corinne Rivera, former podcast guest, and quite possibly the most successful American cyclist we've had in the last few years. Uh, She just did the women's uh, team time trial, and uh, she has had a stellar season. So congrats to everybody participating in the World Championships. In terms of the road race, uh, the the men's road race, I'm going to go ahead and stick my neck out there and go with my pick. Um, it's been kind of tough, but I'm going to go with uh, Julian Alaphilippe. I think he's had a phenomenal season. I'm going to see if he can wear the rainbow stripes for a year. It's definitely a climber's race. Also, another dark horse, I would have to say, is Alejandro Valverde. I think this is a good course for him. Could be one of his last world championships where he could possibly win rainbow. Uh, Not Sagan, unfortunately. I think they made the course specifically just so Sagan wouldn't win the world championship rainbow stripes. So we'll have to see. It plays out on Sunday. Uh, Find it. I'm sure it will be exciting. Speaking of which, let's talk about the state of American cycling. As you know, teams are folding. The teams are experiencing a contraction, uh, and that's leaving riders scrambling, looking for only existing teams to pick them up. Uh, One rider in particular, we are talking with Maddie Ward. She's probably the fastest rider you've never heard of, and we'll get to her results, and, and we'll talk about them during the show. But one of the things about her is, She's talented enough to be getting a pro contract, but she's not overly talented enough where all the teams are recruiting her. She's kind of this in-between limbo state. She's definitely too good for sort of the local race scene. She's proven herself nationally, and Maddie is somebody who is using the offseason to really try and find a team and a good fit for her because she brings a huge amount of talent that a lot of people don't realize. She's a local SoCal resident, but at the same time has competed on the national level. She's uh, she's had a very short career so far, but she could be one of the ones who make it. So you've heard it here first, folks. Maddie Ward on SoCal Cyclist Podcast. Um, let's go ahead and take it away with her. You're riding super strong. Your fitness is like, is it the best it's ever been? Or is it Yes. Or is it starting to Oh, I peaked like Colorado Classic, perfect peak there. And I think I'm coming down now. Um 
the first week after Colorado, I felt awful. I was trying to run more because I'm doing a 10K with my mom. And I just felt horrible on the runs. But now I'm getting better at running again. I used to run in high school. Um, And now I'd say my fitness is still pretty up there. Yeah. And for, for racing at the level that you're racing right now, that means anybody racing at a national level is going to crush whatever local rides in whatever community they're going to do. So you, I mean, we just had a, you know, a Labor Day ride not that long ago and uh, you took a couple Strava QOMs and some Should I brag? Should I brag here? Uh, yeah. Nine QOMs. Nine QOMs <laughs> in a single ride. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, that is a lot. And some of those sections were, were tough. I oh, mean, yeah. we went on some dirt, which is always fun when you take a road bike on there. Oh, yeah. That was a lot of fun. Man. And you haven't really been riding that long in the grand scheme of things, yet you're doing so well. Yeah. Like, you obviously came from a some sort of athletic background. So you ran first? Yeah. Um, well, then... I started playing soccer first. Uh, and then you got injured, right? Yeah. But, I mean, I ran all through high school, so I was playing soccer and running cross country and track in high school um and then my senior year um during soccer season i tore my acl but i wanted to do my final season of track so i did track with a torn acl and then got my surgery once i graduated what what did you run in track long distance so the 3200 1600 800 I tried to stay away from the 3,200. Wow. That that hurts. But, you know, some runners do really well and transfer over. Mike Woods on Cannondale, he's mm-hmm. like a Canadian miler, and he's on the world tour. Oh, yeah. Um, it's But, yeah, no, cycling needs to thank all the soccer injuries in people because so many people. And running I injuries. I didn't even know you got injured in soccer. I just assumed. Yeah. Just because when you get injured in soccer, the best rehab is, like, get on the bike. Mm-hmm. And so it's good because then you discover cycling and you're like, wow, this is kind of fun. Yeah. But you were, you're kind of in a unique situation too. Cause like, didn't you say like your dad rides? Yeah. And so it's always kind of been around. Yeah. It's, I think I told you this on our first ride. I, there's a picture of me in like full kit get up and like a funny little hat at my at a race. My dad did. It was the San Luis Rey race actually. Oh, you were there as a child? Yeah. And my dad was racing it. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. And you were wearing a, just a pro team kit or Not something? Not a pro team kit. I mean, it, there were no like sponsors on it or anything. It was okay. just like a generic, like funny looking kit. And, and you were cheering him on? Uh-huh. I don't remember it at all. Okay. But it's just funny thinking about that picture and now here I am yeah. racing San Luis Rey and everything. Yeah, so you so it's come full circle. You've actually done the race you cheered your dad on for. Isn't that funny? It is weird. Yeah, and that's kind of SoCal's local race. That it's our state uh, championship race, and it's a hard course too because it has a this uphill finish, mm-hmm. and then it does this one eighty degree at this elementary school, and then you descend back down. So if you're looking at the race, you can see people like you can see how far the gap is. You oh know? yeah. And everyone can see and you. And that's so disheartening. And it just freaks you out. <laughs> you're like, oh, I thought my lead was bigger. Yeah. But yeah, and, and it, it what's cool is too, you you ride for this local team, SDBC, which is great. But in a way, you're getting to do these bigger races uh, pretty much by yourself. Yes, mm-hmm. you're required to be on a team for Redlands and Colorado. Um, but at the same time, the local team can't field one, so you, you get to be on these like composite teams and stuff. So, but yeah. at the same time, you, you're basically racing against the best riders and the best teams in the world, in mm-hmm. the country. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, so Redlands kind of was your coming out race. Yeah. You won the best amateur uh, category. Mm-hmm. And then... That's strictly Cat 2, and then that's when you got your Cat 1 upgrade? Yeah. So, was that your first time doing Redlands? No, I did Redlands last year as well. Okay. Um, but I was so unprepared. Yeah. I got a text or a Facebook message uh, from the Jack Roo 
uh, team manager who was fielding a composite team. And Esther Walker actually gave him my contact information because she knew I had just recently upgraded to a two. Uh But I was still racing collegiate. So my training was strictly like for shorter races, not five-day stage races. Um, But I went on the team. I finished. I got second to last in GC, but I finished. Nice. (laughs) Um, And so it was really cool to be able to see my progress this year, uh, how much better I did. And then so how did you do this year? Um, I was in the 20s, I think, GC overall at the end. Okay. Maybe 30, maybe like... High 20, low 30s, I don't know. Yeah. And then most recently, you just did Colorado Classic, which, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of people, it's a it's a very big race. And again, you're on a composite team because you're not on one of these fancy pro teams yet. And uh, how'd that, the preparation for Colorado come for you? And um... uh, So the Amy D Foundation is like a really well-known composite team. And so about... A month and a half before the race, or maybe just a month, um, I got the email saying, hey, you're invited to race with us at Colorado Classic. And I jumped on it because my um, most recent race that I had done was Nationals in um, Tennessee. And my road race didn't go as planned. I got a flat and then had a mechanical Um, and I was really looking forward to that race to see how I stacked up against the pros. And so I was super bummed. And so when I got the opportunity to race at Colorado, I took it, um, told my coach and he's like, it would be great if you could get up there a week before help with acclimating and everything. And so I just started asking my mom if she knew anyone up there. And so I got to stay, my aunt and uncle live up there actually. So I got to stay with them and then family friends for a little bit. I got up there nine days before and it helped immensely. Um, and how'd you, how'd you finish that race? I got eighth overall. That's congratulations. That's, that's so good. I mean, to put that in perspective, you're pretty much probably the only person in that race that rides for a local club, but you're able to crack the top 10 pretty much riding on your own and doing it at altitude Mm -hmm. uh, with people that are seasoned pros. Um, And I think in a lot of ways, it's almost like you're kind of a, I don't use this word a lot, but kind of a prodigy. (laughs) Don't laugh. I I am laughing. Because, I mean, okay, what's a prodigy? You kind of fit the criteria. You're young. Ish. You're you're an athletic prodigy Mm -hmm. and a a brain prodigy. I mean, you just graduated from UCLA, which is no easy feat, and Mm -hmm. you're going to be a doctor. So, I mean, that aside, we'll get to that part later, but in a way, like... You're an uh, athletic prodigy basically doing these big races. Uh, you've done Chico and San Dimas and, and uh, now the most recent Colorado. You, just, you won Big Bear. And in a way, you're doing it by yourself. You're not as experienced as other people. You've been doing it for less time, mm-hmm. yet um, you're able to achieve better results than a lot of the people have. I mean, that's kind of what a prodigy would be, if you think about it. Yeah, okay. yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's good. That is good, yeah. Um, I don't know. I was just really lucky to have parents that threw me into sports. Yeah. Um, I went. I started indoor soccer very early, but um, I was one of the kids that stopped to pick flowers, I think. So. <laughs> so I stopped that and then didn't get back into soccer until third grade. Oh. Yeah, but both my parents are very athletic even now did they like what's that situation like do they put a lot of pressure on you or are they completely hands off and say you just figure it out yourself um, um are they saying like hey we want it'd be cool if you know you could uh you know be in the next olympics or something no they didn't put that kind of pressure on me they were always really supportive um my dad would get really into it he had never really been into soccer before i was mm-hmm. um 
And then after the games, he would always say, like, oh, here's this, what you should have done, like, helpful pointers, constructive criticism kind of yeah. thing. Um, and, no, they've just been supportive of what I've done, really haven't. Like, they always say, like, how cool would it be if you did play in college kind of a thing or um, if you ran in college. But I didn't want to go that way. I went for academics instead, but I didn't feel pressured by them whatsoever. Support, that's what I felt. So it wasn't like, and you went, so you went for academic, were you like on an academic scholarship? No, it's just saying instead of going to a smaller school that I could get mm. a scholarship to or pl- like play soccer or run, um, I just decided I want to go to a, a, like a more prestigious school f- like and focus on my academics. And yeah. then I got into cycling, so club sport. And then it just went from there. And the thing is, too, collegiate cycling is so amazing. Like, oh, yeah. It really is. I mean, you see, I mean, American pro cycling is kind of hurting right now. We have teams that are folding left and right. I know. <laughs> and it's people are scrambling because a lot of pros are looking for having to look for a job or maybe not even have to think about something outside of cycling. Mm-hmm. And collegiate cycling is like thriving. There's so many people into it, and it's so much fun. And the people that do well, really well, um, sort of have a clear path. Whereas maybe before you would be like out of high school and then race for a few years until you got a pro contract. Mm -hmm. And that was really tough because you're really scraping by. Yeah. Which is tough. Do you feel, do you put a lot of pressure on yourself? Um, Yeah. (laughs) Like... Certain races that I haven't had the best results in, I'm hard on myself uh, just because I have trained so hard. And people are always like, that's bike racing. Sometimes it doesn't play out at the end how you want it to. Uh, And I'm learning that more and more. Yeah? (laughs) Yeah. What's been like your toughest day on the bike? Either in a race or just out like out riding have you ever had a have had a point that has just cracked and broken you or are you still kind of climbing towards that point of um almost like it just changes you i don't think i've reached that point yet i've definitely bonked during a ride okay so (laughs) at least you know i didn't come out the other side a different person (laughs) yeah i mean everybody has kind of their one defining ride Mm -hmm. that they do whether it's in a race or training where where you learn a lot about yourself. For me, I it was it was San Dimas stage race. Mm-hmm. It was just pouring rain one year, and they shortened the pros race because there were so many crashes, and I was just gapped. I had no idea where I was in relationship to anyone else. I was by myself. Yeah, I was trying to catch wheels, and I remember I was trying to draft off people. And there was so much water, like the rooster tails from the <laughs> rear tire was like coming up in my face. And I remember not ever reaching for my bottle because I was drinking that water. Yum. And going like, oh, wow, I'm at rock bottom here. <laughs> and then after the race, I just wasn't the same. Yeah. <laughs> like, I was so cold. I sat in the car, turned the engine on, blasted the heater, and just shivered. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, yeah, that, that race... I forget what year that was, but anyone who's done San Dimas in the pouring rain, they know what I'm, I'm talking about. Yeah. It was a few years ago, but it, man, it hurt. Well, speaking of San Dimas, I mean, during that race, during the road race, um, I guess there was a defining moment. Like I was having a lot of uh, self criticism. My mind was just going to the place where, oh, the next time we hit the like the I forget what the climb it's like the short punchy one. Yeah. The next time we hit that, like you can just let them go. Mm. like it's 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 not that big of a deal and as like when i started hearing myself think that i out loud yelled no (laughs) (laughs) and people looked at me like i was crazy and the lady next to you is like no what yeah exactly exactly she's like were you talking to me like what are you doing and then Um, you said who are you calling a psycho (laughs) (laughs) exactly (laughs) oh no i I, I had to laugh at myself at that point because i didn't do it intentionally it just like happened um, and that was like, looking back on it now, I'm pretty proud of myself of, of that moment. So you yelled no and you stayed with them. Yeah. I was like 
shutting up my own thoughts. Okay. Sh- yeah, trying to shut my mind off from being so negative. Yeah. And yeah, I stayed with the group. Um, and yeah, finished. So. I, I mean, do I wonder, at least for me, sometimes my mind wanders in a race, mm-hmm. especially if it's long. Oh, yeah. Crits are different, but because you're always like hyper vigilant, paying attention to everything. Mm-hmm. But do you, do you find like you talk to yourself, your mind wanders in, oh, a, yeah. in a race? Like what were you like for Redlands or Colorado, like some of the longer stages, mm-hmm. um, were you, do you do that? Do you like have this inner dialogue with yourself? Yeah. Chico is the one that stands out the most. It was a 90 mile uh, road race. Yeah. And it was just two lap, two long laps. Mm-hmm. Um, and when we were starting the, B, the starting the second lap, there's just like a straight section that goes for a while. And I was like, wow, this isn't good. Like, I'm kind of bored. I started like looking around and I just lost focus. And so I wasn't into it. And that's when I realized how great it would be to be on a team. Because when you're on a team, you always have a job. Yeah. And so you have to stay focused so that you can execute. Um, and, yeah, I didn't... I get complacent during races, which isn't great. Uh, but well, what I'm if you just, like, went that. up to somebody and you're like, hey, can I get a gel for you or a bottle? I'll drop back on the team car. <laughs> pick up anything you need and come back. But just remember, my name is Maddie. Here's my, here's my card. <laughs> That'd be so funny. Yeah. Yeah. Coming up after the break, we'll hear more from Maddie Ward. For listeners in and around Orange County, a good dentist is hard to find. Just like your bike, your smile needs to be serviced regularly. OC Healthy Smiles was voted 2018's top dentist because your oral health and comfort is our highest priority. See the OC Healthy Smiles difference at your next dental exam and cleaning. Also, mention this ad for a free in-office whitening at your first scheduled appointment. Check them out at OCHealthySmiles.com. Schedule an appointment right now, and their offer is limited to the first seven scheduled appointments, so call before it's too late. That's 714-907-4842. Is your bicycle in need of repair? Have you had a bad experience at your local bike shop? Velofix might be the alternative. Velofix is a mobile bike shop on wheels, and what they do is they go to your home as well as your work, and they'll work on your bike right in front of you. They also carry an assortment of soft goods such as tires and tubes, and will get your bike ready for that next event. Velofix is often seen at many bike races, but can also be seen driving around in case you need them. Velofix will have a quick turnaround time, friendly service, and they'll go to great lengths to make sure you are a return customer. They are featured in almost every major city in the United States, and their base is growing. Velofix is a major bike shop on wheels, and what they have inside those vans is just about everything that the bike shops carry. If they can't do it, nobody will. Check them out at velofix.com. And now back to the SEC podcast with Matty Ward. That's the thing, too. We're approaching the off season. Not approaching. I'm, I'm, we're, no, I'm we're off in the off season yeah. <laughs> for sure. I mean, the only real big races left are like all the world's mm-hmm. events and stuff like that. But um, you're looking for no no offense to SDBC. They're a great organization, but you're looking for a, for a pro team. Um, what's that sort of journey like? What's that struggle like? Is it? I mean, it, it, it sort of reminds me when somebody from a small town wants to move to L.A. Yeah. and become an actor or actress. There's just a lot of competition, mm-hmm. and you're trying to set yourself apart. I mean, with with sports, it's different because you have race results yeah. and things like that. But now is they call it transfer season because uh, people are trying to hustle and, and work. Mm-hmm. Uh What's your ultimate sort of goal for the spring or the beginning of next year? Well, I need to first get on a team (laughs) and then I can, I mean, so right now I'm currently emailing teams and managers and stuff. um, And you've helped me reach out to people, like uh, giving them my contact information. Uh, But for next year, if I do get on a team, I'm 
just looking to grow as a rider, like as part of a team and having a role and stuff and just learning the benefit of being on a team and how much that helps in a race. Yeah. I mean, because your individual results are so strong. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of people like they'll, they're, it's a it's a much more complicated process. Teams want to know like your Instagram and your Twitter <sighs> handles and how many it. followers you have and and, and it's that's fairly, hard. It's hard and it's fairly new, but I think it's not as simple as it used to be. Like, okay, here's a race resume. Here are the races I've done. You've probably raced against some of their their riders, yeah. the teams you're applying for, and beaten a lot of them. Um, but now it's this weird. I don't know. Are you are you on like how's your social media I know. presence? You do have to say. have a presence, yeah. Um, and I need to grow my presence. <laughs> that's for sure. But is it do you do you approach it with like the same way people approach going to the dentist like it's just something that you need to do and it's necessary even though you don't love it? Mm-hmm. Or is it something like what are those like I mean there's those insta famous influencers yeah, that make influencers. a living yeah. off of it and they may not even race a bike but they can just stand next to a bike mm-hmm. and get you know with enough followers you can you can do anything oh yeah is that i mean that's fairly new i'm more of the dentist approach yeah <laughs> and I, and i'm not even there yet like i haven't even gotten to the point where i need to accept that it's necessary <laughs> that you need your teeth <laughs> no well the dentist i understand <laughs> the, the social media stuff i still need to work on yeah it's uh i and, and it's funny too because so many amateurs uh who aren't pro have a pro sort of social media presence it's mm-hmm. weird mm-hmm. they have followers they go live they do things they interact and I just think that's something teams are kind of factoring in. It's sort of like when you're applying for college, it's like your extra, what did you have to do? You had to do in a letter, like a essay. Oh yeah. It's uh, kind of like that version. So you have your GPA. Right. Oh, what's it called? Um, your, like your application essay. Yeah, but they have a certain name that I can't think of because it's been five years since I've had to write one. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um, well, teams, they need their, like, racers to have a presence because that's how they get sponsors yeah. and money. I mean, essentially, if you think about it, you're, you're a marketing tool for whatever brand is the face of that team. Yeah. And they're using you to market a product or an image or whatever. And in exchange, you're racing your bike for fun and mm-hmm. glory. <laughs> All that stuff. So in a way, so you have, like I said, you have your GPA down, your transcripts, your Mm -hmm. results. Now it's just the whole extracurricular part. And unless like you're winning the Tour de France, people do that for, you know, all the big shots. Oh, yeah. I know. I'm sure Sagan has his own team of people. Of course. (laughs) The funny thing is like there's Sagan like fan sites. Like, I bet. That are just devoted to pictures of him. <laughs> so if you want, I can start a fan oh. site for you. <laughs> there wouldn't be too many pictures up, I don't think. We got to get out there. Yeah, we do. Coffee picture, ride picture, podium picture. I'm sure you have lots of those. And then uh, just kind of Motivation Monday ones and throwback ones of you being a little kid in that jersey. Oh, yeah. We, See, I could, I could so use that picture. You're already there. <laughs> You're already there. Yeah. But I, what's your sort of like ideal? So ideal situation. So say like if you could almost play it out the way you wanted it to for next year, how would it go? So I applied for a program foundation thing in Tucson um, called the Home Stretch, And they help pro and elite female cyclists um, survive like – be able to um, sustain their professional cycling career without needing to have a like substantial um, salary because female cyclists don't get that. And so the how like their housing's paid for. Um, so everyone just stays in a house in Tucson together. And you train and stuff like that. Um, so right now, my ideal situation would be, to be on a pro team 
and stay in that Tucson house for six months. And they, it was great for networking. They would help me get more established. Maybe they could help me with social media. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but I don't have like a specific team that I'm gunning for necessarily to get mm-hmm. on. Um, I think just really getting on any team and having that experience is huge. So I, I'm And not... then being on that team, it lets you do all the big races that you couldn't do when you're on your local club or, yeah. you know, you'd have to rely on the composite mm-hmm. status, which is also hard because you don't hang out with them. You don't train with them. Yeah. You know, they're all sort of in that situation. Um, and really... I'm trying to think of the women's teams. Rally is like the biggest one. Rally is the biggest one now. UHC is no more. No more. And they were sort of the other one. And then there's like Hoggins, Berman, and, and a few other ones. Uh, Tibco. Tibco. 2020. Um, and that's all of the UCI ones, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So your goal is to be with one of those yeah. programs. Mm-hmm. So go buy like your favorite kit, like what's your favorite jersey? Oh. And then like. Yeah, <laughs> I know. That might make it easier. <laughs> or work backwards. From yeah, that. I know. <laughs> I would look good in orange and then say, okay, now what do I need to do to get on rally? Uh-huh. I think orange could work out. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be okay with orange. Yeah. Um, but even if I don't get on one of those big teams, I think getting on a domestic elite team mm-hmm. would be huge. Um, and then I would just, the following season, go from there, take the next step, uh, and then hopefully get on the UCI teams. What's your What's your worst case scenario? Like Worst case, and it's not even that bad because I've had a like, great time with them, is that I stay with SCBC next yeah. year. And they've been so supportive, um, and it's been so fun. I've met so many cool people. Yeah. Since I'm new to San Diego riding, I know all the good rides now. <laughs> um, and uh, I have cool people that help me fix my flats. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Flats in SoCal uh, are as commonplace as anything. But it's... but. You would think, right, with all this stuff being a prodigy, having these huge results, you just graduated from one of the biggest schools in the country, UCLA, you would think, okay, you've got it all and you do not have a care in the world and you're just everything stress-free and the Ooh, I wish. path to carve out success is very defined. Mm-hmm. But it's not always that easy, no. you know? I mean, you're... Is, what's the stressful side of things? What's the what's the sort of part that's your that you're not you don't look forward to, or the parts that you're just like, oh, this isn't this isn't the way I wanted it to be, or just you know, is it the uncertainty of everything? It's almost like you're in limbo status right now. Oh, right now I'm in huge limbo. Uh, I have to come to terms with the fact that I'm probably going to have to reach out to teams more than once for them to respond if they ever respond. Uh, yeah, and I mean, because even if you make it, you're not going to be making any money, or very little, money. very little money, and that's why the Tucson home stretch thing would be really cool. Yeah, because I wouldn't have to worry about rent and stuff like that. Uh, not that I worry about that now, but yeah, it would be good to get out on my own a little bit. Yeah, and and the sport is just so behind. Mm-hmm. I just read that. Um, Another big sport in SoCal, the World Tour for Pro Surfing, mm-hmm. just announced equal prize money for men and women in all all events. They ride the same, you know, same waves, same events. Mm-hmm. They have a men's and women's heats. They pay them, you know, equal equal pay. What, there's no reason why we can't do that. I know. In cycling, and it's just, and it's a tough choice that you have to make because, let's say you are like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I have a career waiting for me in the distance, but I, mm-hmm. I want to give this a shot. It, it makes you really have to sacrifice a lot. Yeah. Know? And it's, and it's tough. I mean, you could, you could make more money working hourly at flipping burgers somewhere <laughs> than you can a lot of times racing a bike, but it's just the sport just, it's so demanding and it takes so much from people. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, you know, but then again, regret's a hard thing too. I mean, what, what say you don't say you don't go pro and mm-hmm. 
you don't reach your potential and you look back, are you going to be kicking yourself? Probably. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know what? Now's the time to go for it. Yeah. And I was lucky enough that I could go straight from collegiate cycling into trying to pursue this. Um, so I didn't have a career that would stop me necessarily from jumping into it. Um, and so yeah. what? Like, who cares? Like, let's say you went straight from a career after college. That just means you work, what, five years or 10 years or earlier. Mm -hmm. So you've been in that profession a little bit longer. What I mean, like the prodigy analogy, if you think about it, like, okay, let's say there's like an actual child prodigy mm -hmm. who's like, a genius at math or something like goodwill hunting, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, but then at a certain point, that prodigy, there's going to come a point where they're that child prodigy is no longer going to be a child and mm -hmm. they're no longer going to be a prodigy. They're just going to be smart among their peers. They don't get exponentially smarter. They all eventually, right. unless you're Einstein, right? They all eventually level out. Mm -hmm. So then they lose their childhood because they're socially, that you know, they never, you know, they went to college at 13 or something. Uh, I can't even imagine that. They might not, they don't have any interpersonal skills. They mm -hmm. may have never had a boyfriend or intimate relationship or girlfriend or anything. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, was all that worth it just so you could work earlier? You know, become a become a professor, or a doctor, or a mathematician at the age of twenty. Yeah, and you've been doing it ten years longer than your peers have. Like with with child prodigies like that, though, do you think that's their end goal? I feel like that's kind of just what they're thrown into. But it could be. But okay, like let's say you have a kid who's a prodigy. Do you hold them back, or right. do you just let them do what they want to do? Mm -hmm. But at the same time. It's like, man, they're sacrificing their childhood. Mm -hmm. They don't, but their but their mind it just works in a way that they maybe their EQ, their emotional quotient is so low that they can't even relate to people, uh, their peers, other kids. Yeah, like somebody who does that, maybe they are more relatable to like people twice their age or something, adults that you know are in the field. I don't know. It's, At least it's, intellectually. Yeah, intellectually. <laughs> I mean, but like they've never had to deal with um, sort of adult stuff until they're adults. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It, it's a it's an interesting thing. So I'm not saying like you're gonna you're gonna. <laughs> you're... When I get out of out of cycling and I have to get a career, I'm gonna be like, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> what is this real world? Yeah, I mean, are you? I mean. You're product. You're an athletic prodigy in the sense that you're the you're one of the very few people that can be on a club and race at the pro level, is is what I'm saying, mm -hmm. and 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 do really well. Um, so in, in that sense, you're a prodigy. But at the same time, the athletic side it just doesn't it doesn't stay with you forever. Mm -hmm. Like it has an expiration date. Unfortunately. So I I don't know. Like um, I just think that you know if you don't do it. You're gonna you're gonna regret it, and and maybe I'm projecting that mm -hmm. onto you because, Maddie, I think there's you ride with a lot of people that are ex fast people. I know a lot of ex pros, and yeah, there are people that are still fast, but I think any one of those guys, at least I'm I can speak for myself. I would do anything to be in your shoes. Really, it's like those. What are those movies like? 17 again where they get oh. to go back in time and they get yeah. to be a kid and uh -huh. they live their life again like uh i think yeah like i would do if i if i could be in your shoes i totally would and even though you see it as like hey this is you know stressful and uncertain mm -hmm. it's like you have good problems to have you have you have choices and you have the ability to do that but i think there's a part of every you know, master's person or recreational writer that's like, man, you know, getting to know you going, oh man, you're knocking at the door of a pro contract that could happen in the next few months. Yeah. Like that's something really special and really cool. And it, yeah. And when people first started saying that to me, I didn't believe them. Really? Why not? Because I was coming from 
collegiate racing, which was just a bunch of fun. Yeah. Um, and I was just doing something that I really liked. Um, I had never had a coach before, so I was I didn't really train super hard. This past year was a huge training season for me. Um, and then I wasn't racing the big races with the pros, so I really didn't know, like, am I as fast as these people? Like, I'm doing group rides with guys that are really fast, but I don't know how I actually do will do compared to pros and races. Um, but after Redlands, like it, that was eye opening, and so now I'm starting to believe it myself. And the thing is too, like, you haven't even done a vo2 max you haven't done an ftp test you have you don't even own a power meter yeah just... and no offense to your bike it's nice but it's not like pro like mm. it's it's an it's a good bike but just like equipment wise and you're still crushing it on that and and you're and you're obviously racing against people with very complex coaching programs mm-hmm. and know exactly their the watts they're you know churning out you don't even own a power meter so it's 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 almost like you're just this raw talent Mm -hmm. of a cyclist that if given i think the right resources it's only gonna it's only gonna you know keep getting better and better and better and um it's got to feel good though especially i'm sure at colorado did it feel good like beating people (sighs) on your bike yeah like just dropping them and they're like in a pro kit and you're like yeah well that's (laughs) the thing i don't even think about equipment I'm just out there riding and I don't know enough about the equipment to be like, wow, their stuff is so much more expensive than mine. (laughs) Um, So I never think like, I mean, wheels, I think like race wheels, wheels. like if I had super nice race wheels, um, that's like a thing that I understand. Like you definitely go faster, but I don't think like, oh my gosh, that bike. Like it's so much nicer than mine. Like probably so much lighter. Yeah. Did you ever like during redlands or colorado like walk up to like a team equipment bus and just like hey can i pick this bike up <laughs> just to see no i never have and then be like here check out mine yeah hey i'm maddie <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you can you take three pounds off of yeah this? yeah so yeah almost to the sense of like you don't know enough to until you know and then but i usually find like people who are like get a power meter for the first time or mm-hmm. get a really nice set of wheels or a new bike or even get fit they're like oh my gosh like i didn't even know enough to know that that makes such a difference yeah and then you and then it's almost like flying first class like i can never go back Mm -hmm. once i've sort of been enlightened i can never go back to the sort of the way things things were yeah so so in that sense it's it's kind of good i mean but at the same time like um are you stressed out about just your your training here or just the fact that you were in limbo right now? Mm-hmm. Um, a little bit because I've never had to sell myself before. Mm. Well, hey, you had to sell yourself to go to college, right? True. Yeah. So you just think about it like that. Mm-hmm. So if you, so what do you have so far? You kill a resume. Like most people, honestly, like would, would do if they had the resume, race resume you had would be like, hey, this is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And then social media, let's work on that. Yeah, got to work on that one. And then... Thank goodness you didn't need social media to apply to college. Right? I know. Could you imagine? <laughs> no, I couldn't. But a lot of colleges, they like data mine people now. So I don't know if you heard, like there was a story, um, some incoming freshmen at Harvard were denied admission because they were posting like Nazi right-wing propaganda stuff. Oh my gosh. And they were like, Harvard's like, sorry, you can't come here. Mm. Or it's just, and and colleges will look at like if you're a troll. Oh yeah, and they I think they kind of should, you know, especially if they have standards, mm-hmm. um, and they hold people to that, and you're some Infowars nut job. I wouldn't want that person going to my school. Right, and employers do the same thing. Oh yeah. So I know when like um, coming out of college, friends would change their Facebook profile names so that their employers, like their potential employers, couldn't find them. No way. Yeah. So they'd have like a dummy profile mm-hmm. and then <laughs> their party profile. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> oh man, mm-hmm. that's crazy. But yeah, for cycling, I think just because it's it drives a lot of things. 
a lot of people look at that and go, okay, can they, can they help represent the team, the brand, the whatever? Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it's it's a chore for some people. It really is because most people just want to be out there riding their bikes. Yeah, you know. So, can I get you a selfie stick, and then you can stuff it in your? We were just pop- bashing selfie yeah. sticks. <laughs> well, I was talking to Larissa in one of the previous episodes. We'll get it one of those telescoping selfie sticks. We'll put it in your jersey, and then you'll do your. Hey, yeah. what's happening? I've tr- so I haven't tried a selfie stick, but I have tried like taking pictures on rides, and I am just horrible, <laughs> so bad. I miss myself completely. Like I get the people behind me, but I need to work on that skill. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no. You're good at it. Well, I shouldn't be doing this. I use a GoPro. Mm. So that's a little bit safer because it's just... It's small. It's small. It's compact. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I've seen people with... I saw a guy like narrating his life on the bike with a selfie stick, riding with no hands, just straight up talking. And I'm like, hey, more power to you. Yeah. I'll look you up. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some people do a really good job of that. But, you know, other people... Um, it's kind of dangerous. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Be a hazard. Mm-hmm. Hazard out there. But yeah, so what are you going to do for the off season? Well, I've been talking about doing cross, um, maybe mountain bike. I just, for me, it's important to get a uh, variety in my training um, so I don't get bored and burned out. Uh, are you burned out a little bit yet or are you still kind of right now actually i'm good um it was worse for me mid-season okay yeah um kind of when it started transitioning from local races to races that i had to travel to oh yeah traveling is its own enemy yeah you know eating unfamiliar food and sleeping in beds that you don't normally and i had to travel by myself Mm. that wasn't fun i had to pack my own bike um that was really not fun (laughs) i don't like doing that uh and just the driving yeah and the flying flying. yeah it's the flying that was hard for me do you just try and sleep on a flight oh yeah but i mean it's not the flight itself it's just the preparation for the flight yeah um i'm getting better at it it was all new to like pretty much this year was really the first year that i really traveled with my bike a lot so it was just that was stressful yeah um but the nice thing about being on a pro team, which I learned, is they just keep the team bike with them all the time. Yeah. So you just have a, your own bike that you train with, but then you don't have to fly with a bike because you just fly to the race and your bike is there. And it's pristine. Oh, and yeah. And it's dialed in mm-hmm. and it's clean and it's fit to exactly how you want. And it's just one less thing. So really, like the pros, they just have to think about racing their bike. Mm-hmm. Whereas you're thinking about, do I have to... Get, you know, pack this, where did I put this? Do I have to get a job to supplement my income? Yeah. Um, there's just so many other factors. Mm-hmm. So why do you want to do it? Oh man. Is that too deep of a question? I think so. What if a pro, okay, pretend I'm a pro team, uh, direct DS. Yeah. And, and I'm getting interviewed. You're getting, I don't Yeah. And they're like, why do you want to be on this team? Or why do you want to be a pro cyclist? So, Really, the first time I really experienced how special it is to be on a team was at the San Luis Rey road race. Um, We had a bunch of SDBC people there, and um, we came up with a plan beforehand. Um, I was just going to sit in and hide the whole time, and then all my teammates were going to either cover attacks or attack the field themselves to tire everyone out. And my job at the end was to attack as hard as I could up that final climb um, and hopefully get away to like finish. If I pulled someone with me, at least I would only have to go against one or two people rather than the whole field. Um, and my teammates did such a great job tiring everyone out. I even talked to someone after, another racer. Um, I just jumped and no one could hang on. And... Getting to work with a team like that, that was just so fun. Mm-hmm. It just gave bike racing a whole nother level. And that's why I want to get on the team, to have fun with teammates and get have a role and to f- like really get to work towards the like group success is cool. 
Um, it would be cool to be the GC rider for a team, but to be the domestique, I think, would be pretty awesome, too. I just love working to help other people. Wow. Yeah. I would hire you. Really? Off of that? Off of that, yeah. That's <laughs> huge. Or you could just say what I was thinking, which is like, well, I've beaten most of the people on your team <laughs> as an amateur. So. <laughs> so I deserve it. So give me, yeah, give me a... Uh, a real bike and a nice fancy kit. Yeah. And then I'll show you a race. You know, I just re- <laughs> I just really want to see I want to see out my potential. Yeah. And I know I have so much to learn in this sport. Um in Colorado, I learned that sure I have the talent, but I need to work on being more comfortable in a huge peloton. Mm-hmm. Um being just surrounded by racers, uh being okay with getting bumped holding your ground um so with more race experience with being on a team i'll develop that as well do you feel like you excel in are you already finding like hey i'm really strong when it goes uphill when it comes down to a sprint like do you, mm-hmm. are you already finding like your real strengths so it's definitely climbing um and i think i have a good pop for a sprint yeah i just have not had the results to prove it i need to get my positioning is a weak point like within the pack um at manhattan beach grand prix i was so proud of myself because for the sprint (laughs) i was right on corinne rivera's wheel oh you were yeah and i was like she's pretty good she's pretty good (laughs) i saw how good she was i'll tell you that (laughs) i was right on her wheel and so i'm like this This is is bell lap or yeah like lining up for the sprint oh okay yeah so I'm like, she's an incredible sprinter. Mm-hmm. I'll just follow her and I'm golden. And then just come around. And her. come around her easy, right? <laughs> she managed to squeeze through the tiniest gap and then she went to win. But I was just boxed in. I could not follow her wheel. Oh, man. But you were in the mix. Yeah. I mean, the whole uh, group stayed together for the most part. Uh, but so positioning is key. And then so that I can even see how my sprint really like matches up yeah. with other people and, and corinne's somebody who who basically grew up on crit racing yeah so for her it's instinct and experience and she's got world tour experience mm-hmm. and you're like right there so the funny thing about you and corinne rivera you're kind of like the same in terms of like your stature stature like uh-huh. you're both like i'm i think we pretty much are i'm five one five and she's one. and she's five one yeah yeah Around the same like weight and yeah. everything. So whatever she can squeeze into, you can squeeze into. It's just confidence. <laughs> yeah. It's a confidence thing. How did the legs feel though? <laughs> so good. Really? They felt so good. And that that was one race where I really beat myself up afterwards. Oh, because you felt you could have won that. At least given Corinne Rivera a larger run for her money. Yeah. She kind of just ran away with it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, nothing to take away from her either. Oh, I mean, she's a phenomenon. Um, uh, yeah. She's another SoCal mm-hmm. star. But, I mean, there's no reason that... I mean, do you ever get that way in races? Like, do you ever get like, oh my gosh, I'm with all these... I'm with Corinne Rivera. I'm with the UHC girls. Like, do you ever play that game in your head? Like, wow, they're all shiny and yeah. uniform. With Corinne, I did in that moment. And she like, didn't even have any teammates, though, did I she? I know. No, she didn't. Just did it solo? Uh-huh. But I was just like, it's pretty cool that she's out here doing this local race. Uh-huh. Because, uh, yes, it was pretty much where she grew up. She grew up in Newport area, right? I think so. Irvine or yeah. Newport, maybe. Okay. Um, but I'll admit, I still don't know a lot of racers. Like, I do not know the big names. So I'm one of the people that is going into this race, and I'm not intimidated by them because I don't, you don't, know. I don't know them. I don't know their reputation, how successful they've been, how strong of a rider they are. I'm getting to, getting to know it now. Have you gotten any uh, little bit of a hazing from some of the more experienced people? Because they don't know you, so mm-hmm. are they like, hey, if you get my way, I'm going to... Any of that kind of uh, posturing? No. Um, not like blatantly, um, but they do, I would say, try to intimidate you during the race. Oh. Yeah. How so? Um, they are more aggressive taking like spots. Like if they're, if you leave any sort of gap, um, they're going to take it. Um, 
and they know they kind of have the seniority kind of thing i feel mm-hmm. like uh so but then that. once it comes up to a climb though it's kind of a good equalizer because mm-hmm. then you're just like all right stay on my wheel <laughs> <laughs> or not yeah i know and even since redlands i've gotten to be a better climber uh and so i was super excited before i knew what the stages were going to be like at colorado i was like I was thinking it was going to be super climby. The stages were going to be long. And I was like, oh, this is going to be great. I'll have the opportunity to showcase my strengths, which right right now is climbing. Mm-hmm. Um, and the women's race was completely different than the men's. Our entire stage race was shorter than the men's long road race. So we didn't get long climbs or anything. I was still able to... Um, demonstrate my strength climbing during the first stage. There was a dirt climb that was short and steep. Um, and I got over the top with the front six. And so we were in a break. We were in a break for a while. Did you, did you initiate that break or were you just like, I'm going to, I'm going to stay with these. Yeah. So it was, I did not initiate it. I've initiated a break once, (laughs) which was really exciting. That was at sea otter. Nice. That was really, really exciting. Um, and it was a tactical move, which was also exciting because I'm not the most tactical writer. I don't have the tactics down yet. Uh, but I didn't initiate, it was a QOM lap. So it was at the top of that climb for that lap, people were going to get points. So the people that were in contention for QOM, they went and they were just way off the front. And coming back to my weakness in positioning, I was entering the climb like, mid pack i think and so i just had to surf wheels going up and i saw this front group and i just pushed as hard as i could because i'm like if i get on their wheel it's kind of like i have a break for a while because i'll just sit on their wheel there was a descent that i i'm not the fastest descender so i knew that if i was in no man's land for a little bit i was gonna get caught um so i had to make up a ton of ground and I actually have the QOM for it on Strava right now. So, <laughs> And could you imagine, like, if you had started that at the front of the pack, right. you would have gapped everybody. I don't know about that, but I, at least it wouldn't, I wouldn't have had to burn so many matches. Yeah. Which is incredible. Like, you just have to be smart out there. How did you finish on that stage? Um, mid-pack again. Oh, because it got caught? Or... Yeah, we got caught. But um, the people covering it thought that that was a break that had potential to go which was cool. So yeah. I got my name in uh, write-ups for the stage. Oh, cool. Yeah, it was really cool. Nice. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I, I, I feel that you're, even though you're kind of in no man's land, I think you're in a fantastic position to be in where you are essentially about to start your pro career in cycling, even mm-hmm. though it, it's still a dream and it's not a reality yet. <laughs> That just got me excited, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is pretty cool. <laughs> and it's something that any one of the guys on any group ride, if they were in that position, they'd be like, wow, mm-hmm. they got to take it. So, you know, kudos to you for that. And I think you're a name that's not just going to be in the Peloton. You're going to be sort of at the front of it. The more cycling you do, the more races you do, mm-hmm. the higher level that you're at. And it's all because... You are such a hard worker and you're so dedicated and you love it. So yeah, I think that is a good recipe for somebody who's going to do well in the sport. And I've seen people come and go in this sport. Mm-hmm. Um, teammates of mine, friends of mine. And I think the people that have the longevity in the sport have it up here. Oh, and yeah. I'm pointing to my head <laughs> because... And I'm nodding my head because I agree. <laughs> yeah, because you can't. you can have all the talent in the world and just... And just not have the have all the pieces in mm-hmm. place. So, mm-hmm. and I, I think I think you'll get there. Maybe obviously not today, but uh, who knows? We're we're going to be rooting for you. And uh, the fact that you're right here in SoCal, you're you're in uh, the best possible place to do it. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, how can people find you on your social medias? <laughs> all two or three of your followers. <laughs> I have more. Th- I have more than that because I. Uh, recently made my Instagram profile public. Oh, that helps. Yes. Some 
you look for me that i was about to just give you give you my handle but that just seems so weird to me you i don't want to do it i mean i can maddie ward maddie underscore ward 38 okay mm-hmm. maddie underscore ward 38 yeah. instagram instagram check her out you can listeners out there you'd be like i was one of the early ones <laughs> <laughs> yeah i got on it early <laughs> i'm old school and then you know when it blows up yeah <laughs> We'll go from there. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us and uh, good luck in the rest of next year. Thank you. And that is our show. There's a lot of young cyclists out there, talented like Maddie, with the desire and the drive to pick, get picked up by a pro team. And hopefully they'll do it statistically. Not many will make it. And unfortunately, their dreams will evolve into a different dream but uh like i said i think we're all rooting for maddie as we go so if you want to get a hold of me reach out brian at socalcyclist.org i'd love to hear from you follow me on instagram at socal underscore cyclist as well as facebook socal cyclist podcast uh, and check it out we've got only a couple episodes left in the season this one and then we're going to call it a season very very soon so if you're not caught up on the episodes Go to SoCalCyclist.org and catch up because uh, this has been a fantastic journey thus far. The best thing you can do is share this episode and some of your favorites with other people. Let them know about the show. But until next time, this is Brian Coe from Maddie Ward saying, respect the wave. <laughs>